So it's so good to be able to pick up our theme from last week. We launched it. And uh, as we said, we've uh, been praying and asking God, where are we heading this year? And He's given us these three words. Uh, to rebuild what's broken. To, uh, to restore what's not working like it should. And to renew. To start some new fresh projects. And uh, we're excited to see where God is going to take us. And then what we did last week as well is we want to do something tangible to say that, well, I agree with that, and I'm on board with this. And so we uh, go for an opportunity for people to write their name on a little blob of wood, which we're going to assemble into a little wall later. And so if you didn't do that last week, um, at the end of the service, please write your name. But first, listen to today's message. Uh, because there is a fourth R that comes with restore, rebuild, and renew. And that is resistance. And uh, we're going to see that when God is doing something great, when God starts to do these rebuilding projects, you can expect all hell to break loose. You can expect tri tri crises and trials because then you know you're doing what God wants you to do. And we're going to look through some of the building projects in the Bible and see that as soon as God's people had a heart and a desire to want to start rebuilding, they always faced opposition. There was always a resistance to what God was wanting to do. And this is because when you enter a building zone, it becomes a war zone. And David knows all about building zones and war zones. And so that's where God wants to show us this morning that when there is a restoration and a desire to want to restore, and you'll know that in your life. You know that moment when you say, well, I really should be spending more time reading my Bible, and the next thing, everything just goes wrong. Or you say to God, God, I really am not happy with where I am spiritually. I want to I be closer to you this year. And then, boom, everything just goes wrong. Well, the good news is, that's great. The fact that you're facing resistance means you're exactly where God wants you. And so we're going to look this morning at this reconstruction of the temple and we're going to see that they were just going to do well when resistance comes. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ezra. Uh, we're going to look at two chapters, Ezra chapter 3, where they restore worship, and Ezra chapter 4, where they get resistance to what God is doing. And so chapter 3, verse 1, Ezra, so Ezra is just after the book of Kings and Chronicles. And uh, Ezra the priest had come back with the first load of, um, what do they call this, guys that came back from, uh, from Babylon? Uh, exiles. Ah, there we go. See. And so the first group of exiles had come back and what was big on their heart was to really get the temple going. And they were excited because they knew that they were in Babylon because they had lost focus. They'd been distracted and they'd stopped serving God and so God sent them to Babylon and now they come back and they said, we want to get right. And so chapter 3 of Ezra, reading from verse 1. And when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Jezorak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, he was the governor that came with him, and his brethren arose and built the altar of God of Israel, so they could offer burnt offerings on it, as was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both in the morning and the evening offerings. They haven't even built the temple yet, and they said, well, we've got to get right with God. We can't wait for there to be a temple. We need to get right with God. We need to begin the restoration. We need to get back to worshiping God. And so in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the city, it's just ruins. They built an altar and say, well, let's start with the basics. Let's get back to worshiping God. And then we'll build the temple. And so he gets the priests and the people and they build an altar. And it says, and they were scared. They were scared of what people were going to think. Oh, these radicals again. Look at them building an altar in the middle of the city. But you know what? They didn't care what people thought. Because they were in it for God. They said, we're going to build the altar. And so they build the altar and they begin the sacrifices. 
Verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not yet been laid. Then they gave money to the masons, the carpenters, and food to drink and oil. The people from Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Remember last week we looked at where's the finances going to come from? And God had really been away. Babylon was going to pay. And so they asked Babylon, say, where's that money? Where's those trees you promised us? And Babylon says, here, send the stuff. Verse 8. Now in the second month of the second year, so we've moved on a bit, time has moved, they've got into this worshipping, the sacrifices are there. Coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, Yeshua, the son of Jodak, and the rest of the brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who've come out of captivity to Jerusalem, began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. And Joshua and his sons and the brothers, Cadmiel and his sons and the sons of Judah arose as one to oversee those working in the house of God. Twice already you've heard this, we're one. The people gathered in Jerusalem as one. The people are building the temple as one. There's a unity. There's an excitement. Verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Aphs, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinances of King David of Israel. They haven't got a building, they've just got a foundation. And they're having church. It's like, the walls will come, the roof will come, but praise God, we can have church, we have a foundation. And so the trumpets are going, the worship is going, and there's an excitement. God is doing something. And they sang, verse 11, and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endures forever towards God, uh, towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout. And when they praised the Lord, uh, and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord had been laid. But many of the priests of Levites and heads of the fathers' houses and the old men who had seen the first temple wept when this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that they could not discern from the noise of those shouting for joy from the no noise of those weeping. The foundation is laid and the people are excited because they're looking forward. God is doing something. But there was a group that were looking back. Saying, but we miss our old temple. You know, when God did such amazing things last year in the temple, and, you know, 70 years ago we did worship like this and it was amazing. Stuck in the past. The guys who are looking forward are excited and they're praising God. We're excited what you're doing. You know who's upset? Those who are looking back to what they had. Looking back to what's missing. It's not as pretty as the last one, and it's not as big as the last one. And who cares? That's gone. God is doing something new. Let's look at that. Let's get excited with what God is taking us and not constantly be focused on what we had. That's gone. And so while some were weeping because of what they'd lost, some are excited and passionate and rejoicing because God is starting something new. There is a rebuilding taking place. And so the chapter ends with this excitement. God is rebuilding. And then chapter 4. Now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God, the same God that you seek. And we, are, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Ershurda, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. Now you think, well, this is great. They're wanting to rebuild. They're excited what God is building. And here comes people saying, let's help you build. But listen to the response of Zerubbabel. 
But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's houses of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build the house for our God, but we alone will build the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, of, the king of Persia, has commanded us to do. Now you think, well, that's such an odd statement. I mean, here's guys and they're saying, we want to help you build. But what we can't see is their faces. What we can't hear is their conversation because there's something in Jeroboam's spirit that says, hmm, there is a catch here. There are hidden motives to them wanting to help build. And do you know what it is? Because the culture of the time says, if we help you build, it will be your temple and our temple. You can worship your God, but we also have the right to worship our God because we helped build the temple. We'll have a loophole, a step into the door. And he says, no thank you. But these people are so blessed because you know how they introduce themselves? We worship your God with our gods, but we worship the same God. And Judah says, no, no, no. You might talk about Jesus, but you definitely don't know Jesus. <laughs> because there's no way you can worship Jesus and Baal and this one and this one and that one and that one. If you love God, you love only God. There's only one true God. Let me tell you, when you start to, to proclaim the truth, you will not have everybody excited. And here he stands up and says, you know what, thank you for your offer, but we will do this on our own. God's people building God's temple. We don't want those from other religions helping us build our temple. And then verse 4 gives the real motivation and the heart behind it. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now the true, true motive comes out. These people who also worship God did everything they could to frustrate the building project. And do you know what happened? The building project came to a standstill for 16 years. For 16 years, the people of Israel stopped building because they had just opposition after opposition after opposition and what could have and should have taken a few years to build ends up taking years to finish. And I like that word. And they hired counselors, counselors to frustrate them. They hired clever people with clever words to come and tie them up with legal battles which we're going to find in the rest of the book. Backwards and forth battles between Persia and Babylon and Israel and Babylon and Israel and letters and letters and this one accusing this one and this one accusing that one. Politics. Politics sneaking in to stop what God is doing. Frustrating the plans of Israel. What do we know about these people that were frustrating the plans? Well, we know they weren't Israelites because they give us a clue that just said that we were brought to Israel by the Assyrians. And when you read what happened in the book of Kings, you find that the king of Assyria came into Israel north, took all the people from Israel north, scattered them all over and brought their own foreigners back in the land. So these are guys that are from other countries that have been brought to Israel, that have been there for 70 years, and they think we're Israelites. We've been here for 70 years. We have just as much right. But that's where they're mistaken. These guys are foreigners. Now, does, does God have a problem with foreigners? No. How do we know that? Because He's using the Sidon and Tyre and they're sending building projects. The problem is these guys have an ulterior motive. They wanted to bring false gods into the temple. That's what it was. And so for 16 years, the project Stops. Let me tell you, Satan discourages progress. He will do whatever he can to try and stop what God is doing, to try and stop the momentum. It got so bad, in fact, in the book of Peter, 
the, the, the early church was facing so much persecution, it was starting to question, have we done the wrong thing in leaving Judaism? And Peter says, count it, James says, to count it all joy. Recognize that this is a good thing that you're going through challenges because it means you're doing what God wants you to do. Not only do we find that, but I want you to jump over to Nehemiah. Not only did the temple find extreme challenges, but Nehemiah, when he wants to build the wall around the city again, doing what God's told him to do, build the wall, protect my city. Nehemiah chapter 4, we find a very similar story, same pattern. When someone wants to do what God has told them to do, and a rebuilding project, restoring the walls of Jerusalem, then we find this in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17 to 20. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded with themselves that with one hand they worked on the construction and with the other hand they held the weapon. Every one of the builders had a sword on his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And then I said to the nobles, the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we must separate far from one another on the wall. But when you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally together, because our God will fight for us. Now you read that and you think, why do you need a sword when you're building a wall? Because just like in Israel, there were opposition to Nehemiah. There were people that were threatening their lives. Stop building the wall or we'll come and kill you and your family. Intimidation. Legal battles again. And you know what's worse? Is that often it was people that were, were neighbors, friends. People who they thought were on their side. Who stabbed them in the back. That they needed a sword to protect themselves. And let me tell you, church, if we're going to be excited about letting God rebuild, restore, and renew, we need to put on the full armor of God because we are entering a battle zone. And you need to know that God has given you a sword to strap to your side, and it is the living word of God. It is the only thing that we use to defend ourselves. When they accuse us and challenge us, we say, but God's word says. But God's word says. I love the way Hebrews describes God's word as living and powerful. Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, to the joints and the marrow. It is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Church, if you're going to commit to this project and say, God, I want you to rebuild, to restore, and to renew what's in my life, let me tell you, you can expect some resistance. Sometimes it's going to be from those who work with you. Sometimes it's going to be from those outside that are not saved. Sometimes it might even be from someone in the church. But you know what the Bible says? We don't raise our flesh. That's not that person. We recognize that there is a spirit behind it. And the spirit wants to frustrate what God is wanting to do in your life. Don't buckle. Don't throw in the towel. But fight the good fight. And recognize that God is wanting to rebuild, restore, and renew. And when He does that, you can expect some resistance. And that's okay. Because as we found in Nehemiah, Nehemiah ends his passage by saying, God will fight for us. God will fight for us. If you surrender to Him and allow Him to rebuild, restore, and renew, He will get you through that resistance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning that You've laid on our hearts this desire to want to rebuild, restore, and renew. Father, everyone sitting here this morning has a different thing in their life that they want to rebuild has a different place or a different aspect of their heart that they want to restore. They have new dreams and, and dreams that they want to, ministries they want to do. 
But Lord, we know from your words, examples, that when we get the place where we want to do more for you, we can ex expect resistance. Help us not to throw in the towel, but help us to stand strong. Recognizing that we don't fight principality over people, flesh and blood, but we fight in principalities, powers, and rulers of the dark world. And Lord, may we not be used by the enemy to frustrate the plans of someone else. May we not be used to the enemy to, to hinder and to stop the rebuilding process that you're doing in someone's life. But may we turn our eyes to you and say, Lord, rebuild, restore and renew, even though it makes resistance. Sometimes we're the ones resisting. But we want you to rebuild, renew and restore. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. While we're singing your final song, if you haven't filled in your name and you're okay with resistance, please come and write your name on a piece of block, throw it in the basket. And uh, if your kids are at Sunday school and you want to include them, just write their names on to you um, and uh, throw it in because we want everyone to be part of saying this is this is what we're renting. We want in God to.